Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and thank you all for joining. And a good day to you, wherever you are dialing in from. From Ukraine to Afghanistan, to Yemen and Sudan, and most recently in Gaza, civilians continue to pay the highest price when healthcare is under attack. For anyone who has watched the news over the past few weeks, it is clear that attacks against healthcare are a grave threat to everyone living in areas affected by conflict. The impacts of the attacks on healthcare workers and facilities are simply devastating. Protection and health teams um, in, in over the past few years have implemented protection-centered health interventions to reduce the impacts of attacks against healthcare. In this session today, we will look at different operational level best practice interventions to reduce this type of violence, as well as the impact of the violence on the people affected. Practitioners from Syria, Yemen, South Sudan and Colombia will share their experiences with interventions that have supported the reduction in violence or have supported communities to cope with the impacts of such attacks. They will speak to the collaboration between health and protection teams and what it takes to prevent and mitigate impacts of attacks on healthcare. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Samira Tika from IRC, Hall of Syria. She is the protection cluster co-lead. She will share with us about protection of civilians and healthcare facilities in armed conflict, its scope and definition, and the impact of attacks on healthcare. Over to you, Samira. Uh, thank you so much, Jane, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> so as we all know, the protection of civilians and uh, healthcare in armed conflict is a critical aspect um, of international humanitarian law and human rights law. Um, international humanitarian law, especially the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols, uh, provide clear protection for uh, medical personnel, medical vehicles, facilities, and patients during armed conflict. Um, and this protection also includes the principle of distinction, which requires parties of the conflict um, distinguish between civilians and combatants and between civilian objects and, civi uh, and military targets. Even uh, the combatants, if they are not engaged in uh, hostilities anymore, are still protected under international law. Um, also, international humanitarian law uh, under uh, under IHL, any attack that deliberately targets healthcare facilities or uh, does not take appropriate um, uh, measures to avoid destruction of healthcare facilities is illegal. Therefore, we see the principle of proportionality and distinction here are applicable. The IHL also um, gives the primary responsibility for protection of civilians and of health uh, care to uh, the states and the parties that are controlling the geographic area where the civilian population are located. Uh, that also includes the um, non-state actors, armed uh, groups that are controlling those areas. So the responsibility is on the states and uh, whoever is controlling uh, the areas where the civilian populations are located at. Uh, we also have, uh, in addition to this, the UN Security Council Resolution 2286. Um, this resolution was adopted in 2016 and is strongly condemned attack against medical personnel facilities, transport um, uh, uh, during the armed conflict and emphasis the need to respect and protect uh, all of this. It also urges the state and parties to the conflict to develop effective measures to prevent, address, and investigate these attacks. However, um, as Jane mentioned, as we have seen, unfortunately, despite having all of this legal framework and international norms, we see that in reality, um, these laws are often ignored. Uh, we see the increase of attacks on civilian infrastructure, population, like uh, very recently, in the past month, we've seen um, hospitals are being attacked, targeted, um, schools and uh, civilian infrastructure, unfortunately, and that has led to countless, countless of civilians and medical personnel uh, uh, losing lives. Um, we already in this year, we've seen so far, uh, Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition has reported over 1,500 attacks on healthcare 
and killing over 300 healthcare workers. And um, I mean, I'm sure this number is increasing even as, as we speak. So uh, generally these attacks, you know, include of obviously direct violence in the form of bombing, air raids, um, you know, withholding medical supplies, uh, but also nonviolent interferences, which is threat threatening, intimidating, um, arresting the healthcare workers and interferences with the healthcare. Uh, we also seeing the misuse of health facilities and ambulances for military purposes uh, that occurs frequently. And these are all against uh, the violations of IHL. Um, World Health Organization um, basically defines attack as any act of verbal or physical violence that obstructs or threatens to interfere with the availability and delivery of healthcare services during emergency and or with patients access to healthcare. So we see that access to healthcare is also an issue uh, and uh, uh, attack on healthcare, what, what we mean is attack on healthcare also include uh, patients access to healthcare, preventing access to healthcare. Um, so some of the impacts of uh, conflict on healthcare, of course, um, there are numerous dimensions of, of the impacts um, that includes um, personal impact on health worker, that includes death, um, injury, emotional distress, that also applies uh, to the patients. Um, patient could die, more injury, intimidation from seeking health, and so on. We also have a destruction as, of health care facilities that seriously impact the um, health system where, where the population are affected by the conflict by reducing uh, the availability, accessibility, and functionality of the healthcare system. In a context where I work uh, in Syria, we have seen these attacks against healthcare facilities or system happening over the years. Um, in some areas, we have seen that uh, it's basically has really weakened the healthcare system in, in some areas in the country. Many doctors have fled and uh, basically leaving the system uh, coping with the uh, health needs. Um, we've seen many healthcare facilities are being built or relocated to geographic areas that are uh, far away from the, the front lines. And that's especially true in terms of, you know, with the um, protracted uh, conflict situation that limits access to health services for communities that are in uh, conflict zones. And that we have seen in Northwest Syria, we, uh, IRC recently published a report uh, in, uh, in uh, Northwest Syria where uh, pregnant women, for example, reported that they have to travel a long distance to seek mel uh, medical care. Uh, in some instances, people are um, avoiding going to the healthcare or hospitals uh, fearing um, that those places become a target because it ha happened time and time again. Um, pre pregnant women, for example, uh, the report actually was one of the findings that um, they opt for C-section instead of uh, natural birth because they don't want to spend as much time in the hospital. Um, in general, there are reports of um, you know, harmful coping practices, uh, people who in need of treatment, or especially the patients who need regular treatments, uh, suffering from chronic diseases, for example, like treatment cancers or uh, treatment for the cancer, or uh, I don't know, dialysis, that they need regular visits or avoiding those visits, um, which could uh, negatively affect them in, in many cases has led to uh, increase the number of deaths um, that could have e been easily preventable otherwise. Um, so we discussed, we, we've seen, um, I mean, there are legal frameworks and um, which most of the time are not being respected and the impact on healthcare. Um, so it's today we're here to see what are some of the best practices that health and protection actors uh, could do to support to prevent or reduction of the civilian harm from the attacks on healthcare and how to um, basically improve the health outcomes as well as the protection outcomes in term, in the cases where um, the, the, the attacks on healthcare um, is happening and impacted the population. 
As we know, protection is fundamental to quality um, of health response, um, and a quality health response contributes to the achievement of protection outcome. Um, so I'm just going to give you some examples um, at operational level, operational level interventions. And then uh, in the following sessions, we will look at uh, some of them more closely. Um, so it, advocacy and awareness raising, it's very important. Um, this has been done in various operation by jointly by uh, protection and health actors or separately, but it's to raise awareness about the importance of uh, protecting healthcare facilities uh, during the conflict at international um, and local levels. Um, also advocacy can put pressure on the parties uh, to the conflict to adhere uh, to their legal obligations to protect civilian and civilian infrastructure and to promote greater ac accountability for violations of IHL. Um, also, um, establishing or strengthening the existing mechanisms, uh, existing mechanisms for documenting um, attack uh, and monitoring attack on healthcare facilities and personnel. Um, these reports are also very important and are being used to develop uh, protection, health, or legal intervention and response, uh, and also to generate support for protection efforts. Um, and you know, and these are being used as advocacy tools, basically. Um, example is the WHO surveillance system uh, for attacks on healthcare in conflict. Um, we also have seen training healthcare workers and security personnel on IHL uh, could be um, useful um, uh, in basically training on the IHL and the rules, rules of protecting healthcare facilities. This can help uh, to prevent accidental violations and ensure compliance. Um, humanitarian negotiations, this also, um, I think, is a very, um, has so far proven to be effective. I mean, of course, that depends on the context that uh, we are operating um, in, but uh, engaging in negotiation with parties uh, to the conflict to basically secure the commitment to protect healthcare facilities, for example, and allow uh, safe access to medical personnel and humanitarian aid is really important. We have seen that not just for um, on, on um, uh, protecting health facility, but also schools. Um, and other uh, civilian uh, infrastructure, but especially health and schools, and therefore is applicable to other uh, sectors as well. Immediate uh, response and emergency response intervention jointly done by protection and health to reduce barriers uh, that people face in access and health care uh, during the armed conflict. Uh, this could be, um, I don't know, include uh, cash-based intervention um, and to reduce like Maybe there are additional costs for transport, um, as mentioned earlier, and uh, providing the you know the provision of information for alternative services. Um, so, in short, uh, these are some of the examples uh, that we have seen you know uh, in different uh, contexts and operations around the world. Of course, these are uh, we we're talking about very different contexts depending on. Um, you know, who's in control of those territories, whether they're states, whether we're dealing with uh, non-state actors, um, uh, you know, the capacity in terms of access and, you know, uh, having the uh, actors on the ground and so on. Um, so, um, um, as I mentioned, um, we're going to, um, in the next uh, presentation, see some of the protection center um, health intervention and uh, some of the promising practices from um, Yemen, South Sudan, and Colombia. And we're hoping that this example could provide us, could uh, provide the protection and health workers um, uh, with uh, useful uh, tools, uh, useful ideas uh, to be able to um, mitigate or to reduce the impact of attacks on healthcare and on the population which who are affected by it. Uh, with that, I um, give to Jane uh, and thank you so much uh, for your time.
Thank you so much, Samira, for setting the stage for this discussion and sharing those insightful thoughts and examples of your own experiences uh, in Syria on how protection and healthcare workers um, can work together to address uh, these issues. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce our next uh, six speakers who will present their operational perspectives of best practices currently being implemented by protection and health clusters uh, in South Sudan, Colombia, and Yemen. From South Sudan, we have Dr. Mukesh, Health Cluster Coordinator. Uh, we have Shehu from IRC South Sudan. And we have James Key from UNIDO. We also have from Colombia, Dr. Jose from ICRC. And from Yemen, we have Dr. Osan. Starting with the team in South Sudan, Dr. Mukesh, James and Shehu. Could you help us understand the context in South Sudan and what you have learned from the response strategy? Thank you so much, Jen and colleagues. Uh, greetings from South Sudan. Um, as uh, previous speaker has said, centrality of protection is very important in what we are doing um, and how we are doing together health and protection uh, cluster uh, actors. Um, today, we uh, I have uh, together with Sehu and uh, uh, and James. Uh, uh, Sehu uh, represent international NGO and, and uh, James represent national NGO and I represent a cluster. Um, so um, we will uh, go through with how we, together we uh, do the protection and health interventions together. Uh, so just to give you a background, uh, next slide. Um, South Sudan is facing worsening humanitarian crisis uh, and um, many uh, factors are um, uh, responsible for um, current complex crisis so conflicts going on subnational violence is uh, going on food insecurity in many areas are under food insecurity climate crisis uh, and uh, uh, outbreaks, uh, disease outbreaks, uh, currently measles going on, hepatitis E is there. Uh, so um, it's a complex humanitarian crisis and we are running and on uh, so many fronts. Um, in 2023, uh, we are targeting 76% uh, uh, these are people in need and that's uh, coming to 9.4 million. Um, in uh, here 2023 humanitarian response plan, we are targeting 50, uh, 55, so half of the population and 72% of the um, people in need. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for health, what we do is a uh, three-pronged approach. Uh, we provide essential life-saving health services. Uh, we address uh, outbreak-prone diseases, so manage disease outbreaks. Uh, and we ensure that um, we we are connected with uh, uh, other uh, clusters or or sectors which are very important um, in in a, in a various way. One of the is to referring pathways for MHPSS, GBV survivors, uh, and um, maternal and child health emergencies. Uh, we have a um, broad community. We use a community health system as a base to provide services in addition to mobile clinics uh, and. Uh, other static health services. Uh, um, uh, next slides. Um, so um, let me hand over with this uh, backgrounds, uh, how we work together. Uh, Shehu can give some uh, practical experience and, uh, and recommendations, uh, followed by James, uh, that uh, how we take forward. So over to Shehu. Thank you so much, Makesh, and uh, thank you, uh, Samira, for giving a, a, a quick background on the on the situations around attacks on healthcare. Um, ideally, no any healthcare provider need to die as a result of or need to be attacked as a result of his service to humanity. Um, it is quite unfortunate, but of, of course, I would. Uh, want to say that uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, research which has been conducted and of recently uh, uh, safe, safeguarding health in conflict reported that uh, 
uh, up, we, we, uh, about 24 incidences of uh, violence against and, and or obstructions on healthcare have been reported from South Sudan so far and within within this year and also we've seen that uh, in 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 ev in in seven in every seven cases of attacks on health on healthcare workers one of that is coming from one of those reports comes from, comes from South Sudan that's to tell you how complex uh, South Sudan is and and uh, of, of of recent we have a cases where um, 10 healthcare workers were killed and also um, 20 healthcare workers were kidnapped um, so that that really really have great impact on both not just only the health service providers but also to the services and to the beneficiaries we are serving um, some key scenarios where we have um, some key scenarios of in incidences include uh, a, a healthcare worker that was severely injured among uh, other other key staffs, and uh, in that same year we had an incident where one uh, healthcare healthcare worker was killed. Um, and also, similarly, we had a medical doctor as well who was equally killed within South Sudan. And we had several cases of attacks, both on the individuals, staff, on the, and also on health facilities. And also, we have issues uh, of vandalization where health facilities were being vandalized, and as well as uh, uh, the, the direct attack on on the community where we serve, and as well as on the on the beneficiaries. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So um, when we look at when we talk about attack on healthcare, it also carries a lot of consequences, uh, which which could be on the direct health service provider itself, and also uh, um, on the on the community where we serve, and also. Uh, um, the, the general response. So one of the, the the consequences on such kind of attacks would not will be on the humanitarian action. Definitely, whenever there is an attack, it's on on healthcare mean that uh, access becomes a big issue. So which will lead to suspension and as well as a closure of uh, health health facilities, which would also impact greatly on the humanitarian action in those communities and also we've seen cases uh, we've seen where such kind of attacks also impact on the health facilities where 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 the 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 health facilities that are quite limited are being destroyed and also we've seen a lot of uh, staff who are being injured had some a lot of physical injuries and also which they have to be evacuated out of the field and in that case, also, it's uh, it's uh, it's 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 it have a great impact on service provision, meaning that with the the service pro service providers who are meant to be there to provide services will no longer be there. And we've seen also cases of some of the the, the staff who are being directly attacked also coming up with a lot of uh, psychological torture, which also requires a lot of uh, psychological. Uh, uh, support for them. So we have to also evacuate those staff out of the field, which also impact greatly on the services and also significant reduction on health services. Um, health services uh, also because as, as you all, as you rightly know, South Sudan have high rate of, um, of maternal mortality and also uh, one of the key uh, Issues around South Sudan as well is is that it is uh, it, 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 um, it South Sudan have high rate of health as um, limited health facilities uh, functioning. So with this with this kind of frequent attacks, it also go a long way to limit the the the, the access for women to access care. So that also increase the level of home deliveries, which which trigger the high rate of uh, maternal mortality and and then um, we have a lot of cases of disruption in supply chain for medical supplies 
which is would really also impact the services uh, of uh, humanitarian response in South Sudan. Um, next slide. So um, when we look at this, what is our recommendation? We we look at it from three from three dimension. One, as organizations or implementing partners within South Sudan, we were looking at uh, we need to also go a long way to improve on physical infrastructure of our our our, our service points. For example, the creating parameter fencing and also ensure that we reinforce, put in more, more security just to provide some deterrence in case there's any uh, form of attack that may come. And also early, we should be able to make use of early warning mechanisms, both at the community level, at government, and also at inter agency level to be able to get, 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 generate, uh, the right, get the right information to be able to take action as, 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 as early as possible. And then also um, creating of great uh, feedback mechanism, good feedback mechanism for both the, the patients we serve and also their relatives will also go a long way to help us to get the right information about the services we are providing and as well as to see if there are any issues that needed to be addressed, we'll be able to address them in a timely manner. And also um, existing um, use of existing monitoring and reporting mechanism. For example, the, the WHO surveillance uh, system on, on attacks and also uh, uh, OCHA reporting mechanisms, all those are the reporting channels that could also be well utilized to be able to monitor the trends of attacks. And also um, from the as from the angle of the donors, we also need the donor to, to provide sufficient funding to meet um, identified health need according to the humanitarian response framework. And also we need a lot on advocacy because uh, most of these attacks that go unreported are not being advocated for. So we are raising out our voice uh, from South Sudan to say there's a high rate of attack in South Sudan and we need a lot of advocacy on that regard. And in terms of government, we are called uh, advocacy and legal framework should be in place to be able to protect healthcare workers, to be able to protect assets, and as well to be able to protect the system. Because um, healthcare workers, we are there to support the system. We are here there to, to provide healthcare, and we, we are there to ensure that no any patient dies or no and any patient is inflicted as a result of disease. Uh, but we are not, we should not be the target. And also um, stakeholders, consultants and sensitization, uh, sorry, uh, consultations and sensitization on, on responsibilities and accountability. So we should be able to um, hold, 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 people should be held accountable for their actions and, 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 and it should be done in the rightly manner and um, and I think that is what we uh, we from uh, the humanitarian uh, 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 plat platform in South Sudan uh, are, are speaking out on a loud voice. So I'm going to give this opportunity for uh, my colleague James to be able to take us through into some of uh, the key um, areas that uh, that just to to throw a bit more light on. Uh, John, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Market and Chahut, and uh, thank the colleague from the Global. And uh, yes, indeed, my name is James Kerr. I'm the executive director for UNIDO, and UNIDO is a national NGO in South Sudan. I'm happy to, uh, to see Eva uh, online. This, 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 this is a good uh, opportunity to see a long colleague. And uh, a big thanks to the organizers of these meetings. So as, I, as my colleague presented, I'm going to also build on some of the recommendations that um, Chahu would have just recommended. And uh, some of the, the lessons learned are on the positive uh, lesson learned uh, on the process. But uh, all of us will have to understand South Sudan fall into the fragile state. And I believe all of us on this platform are presenting the fragile states as a UN definition of country with conflicts. 
So some of the lessons learned from the process of all these conflicts and, uh, and the protection concern is that the um, government uh, of South Sudan have shown the leadership and the ownership. And this is very important because whatever happens on the atrocity, whatever happened on the abduction of the health workers, is the government that takes the leadership, is the government that takes the ownership. And, and that is very practical. So we have seen that and we do appreciate that. And uh, second thing that we also took out a, a good lesson learned is there has been a lot of, uh, you know, like partnership between the international, the national, the UN agency, and other actors like MSF, ICRC, South Sudan Red Cross Society, and, and the rest. So the humanitarian family has been moving together and work together and share all the pain and share all the challenges. The third thing that we have also taken as a lesson learned is actually on the engagement. Uh, take an example of communication. In South Sudan, the, the clusters are, are doing an amazing job, and I must admit, as a local partner, that a lot of services, a lot of uh, um, uh, price that we are discussing today come from the clusters, and that is a big thing to the, to the UN family who are uh, managing these clusters. So communication has been very uh, much on top of everything, and uh, people are getting information and all that. Then the fourth thing is the integration and the mainstreaming of the both internal and external uh, and cross-cutting uh, existing of practice. So, and this is something that is also go back to the uh, to the clusters because clusters are the one who are very much close to the to the implementing partners and the implementing partners are the ones that are actually uh, uh, working with the community. And the fifth thing that I just wanted to mention is the fact that the service delivery has been ongoing, even if there is uh, an insecurity because of the partnership between the national and the international and the UN uh, agencies. So whenever there is uh, an insecurity that will result into an evacuation, services are not in stock. So the local organization will remain on ground and will continue providing the services and report to the respective cluster and also to the lead of consortium. So those are some of the lessons learned, and uh, of course there are many. It's just because of time, we only pick those few lessons learned, and um, I'm so thankful to our class coordinator. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Mukesh, Shehu, and James uh, from uh, South Sudan for those um, examples that you have provided. Uh, we'll now move on to Latin American, where we have uh, Dr. Jose, from ICRC in Colombia. Dr. Jose, could you explain to us how ICRC is implementing integrated health and protection interventions to reduce the impact of violence on healthcare? Over to you. Thank you very much. I will do my best in 10 minutes. It's a, it's a big challenge. A good afternoon, morning, and evening to all of you from different parts of the world. It's a it's a honor, and I really have to thank the organizers to have invited ICRC and to and to have invited us to represent. I feel also representing Latin America. Um, wait, can, can we move to the next slide, please? Colombia is the country of diversity. It's the second biodiversity in the world, and is the the seventh in Guinea inequalities. It's a country apparently a functional state with patches of a failed state under the control of armed groups that coexist with a functional state. Um, this, this results in a humanitarian crisis that is less visible. It's, it's uh, according to Ochala's year, it's approximately 10 million uh, people in, in need in Colombia. And as you see for the figures there, Colombia has been the second a country in report the landmine victims between 2009 2019 and in 2021 was the third country in 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 internally displaced people due to the conflict uh this half of functional state that exists in colombia has has given rise to paradoxical situations like a extremely highly developed normative on protection of healthcare. um um about the situation of, of uh, can you click once more, please? Just to allow the animations to work, okay. Um, 
violence against healthcare has been constantly reported. Colombia has a has also a very complex conflict with a with a non uh, non international armed conflict with a formally identified non state armed groups, a leftist guerrilla. FARC, ELN, and, and, and range now that coexist with organized crime. You will remember Pablo Escobar and a, a gang urban violence groups. It's a very compounded and complex yeah. dynamics that hits healthcare repeatedly and brutally. As you can see that in the statistics, Ministry of Health, among these fantastic developments, it has a system to, to report and keep track of, of uh, violence against healthcare. Uh, as you can see, from 2018 to 2022, we have quadrupled the number of attacks. And if we look at the homicides reporting within the system, it has grown from, from 111 per year, three in 2021, and seven in 2023. We are really heading for a, for a, for a difficult situation. And a, as the ICRC has a confidential contact with healthcare staff personnel in the, in the conflict affected areas, we know that like every reporting system has under reporting, but in this case, it has a qualitative uh, under reporting. The ones that are not reported are the most severe events. We have regular uh, verbal aggression by frustrated uh, parents in the, in the emergency department, common in the whole world. We have physical aggression. We have armed communities threatening and attacking healthcare. We have organized crime, extorting, and, and, thief, and, and theft of, of material. And we have um, security forces disrupting the service by heavy percent armed in the, in the facilities, or by, or, and mostly non state armed groups regularly taking healthcare staff and, and taking it far away to, to take care of, of health staff, death threats, killings, et cetera. It's a, as I said, it's a very, very complex. Uh, for all of this, the ICRC has a first. Since 1996, the ICRC, hand in hand with the Ministry of Health and Colombian Red Cross, identified this problematic and worked little by little, step by step, in developing a normative, a normative that includes a, um, a, a manual for implementation, includes an interministerial and institutional platform that conveys police, army, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Labor, and a few other in institutions, civil institutions, to regularly, it used to be monthly after COVID, we are having it tri-monthly or, or, or bi-yearly, convey to, to discuss on the report, I think it's quite unique, then the, the reporting system that I said in the, epidemiological, in the epidemiological way to identify what the problem is and tailor the interventions to that. That is why the qualitative and the reporting is hiding the most severe events and we are not tailoring the response to these most severe events. Uh, the ICRC has a comprehensive, uh, uh, in, inside the ICRC, completely uh, multi-departmental uh, and, 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 and multi-approach. Health protection and the legal advice IHL work really hand in hand with our FAST, which are the ones that our colleagues that work with the state forces. And we, um, we do a wide range of interventions that focus uh, first on the armed actors, how to interact and engage with them to decrease their, 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 their actions against healthcare. Second, with the, with the authorities, this commitment of working with the Ministry of Health uh, keeps alive today. I see a system main advisor to the Ministry of Health where normative exists, it needs to be adapted to the new context, and the ICRC is very active on that. Um, third, we work in supporting healthcare staff in the conflict affected areas with, a, first of all, identification, follow up, and support to a specific incidents, but also we have a mental health program on the line of, of caring for care, helping the helpers, those of you who may know, which aims not only at providing. Um, psychological first aid, but uh, uh, developing sustainable healthcare, health, mental health uh, resilience for these healthcare teams. Second, we have a, a security management training for healthcare staff. We are handing over to them our NGO and humanitarian organizations skills on security management, so they are a bit more resilient to that. Um, thirdly, we have uh, some interventions, as, as we saw in South Sudan, on the on the physical infrastructure. And um, 
and we have a intervention at community level with which aim partly our dissemination and, and awareness and secondly in some cases are decreasing the aggressions of the community towards the healthcare facility it's a it's a, i think it's a bit of a political incorrect but communities sometimes are perpetrators of violence also we have we have put them together with the with the healthcare staff and have developed a model of interaction friends of healthcare is the program that has yielded uh, excellent results in turning around completely by by mediating and approaching the two of them but and i hope i have time to get into this the real thing is the engagement with the arms bearers and here i have i want to go a little bit more in detail first of all the icrc does by its own nature and mandate a confidential dialogue with both the state security forces and the non-state and groups in colombia today healthcare uh, the violence against healthcare is prioritized and it's, it's inserted in any dialogue with any of them in the ongoing dialogues the specific violations of normative or, or events against healthcare they are individually and confidentially discussed with the perpetrators be whoever he or she or it is and and promoted the, the, the improvement of the situation besides that we have the crc is invited to formal training on ihl to state security forces mostly police and for the last two years the health unit of icrc is invited to participate to provide a non-legal point of view, but the public health and a, I would say a human point of view on the violence against healthcare, to make sure that scores and scores of we are we are doing a, a one hour and a half presentation on on protection of healthcare uh, from a, from a health point of view to all the police ranks that are being promoted to captain and mayor and colonel. So I think we are having a cumulative impact, and uh, this is for formal training. We have a, a module on protection of healthcare for all the first state training the ICRC does, mostly for with the non-state armed groups, but exceptionally with the with the police also. Um, and but probably this is all still uh, within the within the conventional view of, of what should be done. I wanted to bring something a different angle is that considering how the access to healthcare of the war wounded arms bearers, the, 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 the state security forces and the non state armed groups, has in Colombia an enormous negative impact on healthcare because they both seek uh, the civilian healthcare system for the war wounded in ways that, that interfere and damage the civilian healthcare system. We are working on, on one hand, on improving the access to healthcare or war, of war wounded army soldiers, policemen, and guerrilla fighters. Remember that they are all human beings that deserve attention in healthcare. And according to IHL, they are no longer combatants and they are fully protected. Uh, hoping and, and, and working on the on the assumption that this will happen, it's work in some places, an impact on decreasing the pressure on the on the civilian healthcare, healthcare system. But also we have started organizing a um, at national level in a very formal way aiming at normative and at local level in a pretty pragmatic way mediating by sitting down military authorities and uh, healthcare authorities or managers of hospitals to to prepare contingency plans for the repeated events of them bringing a war wounded to a hospital and interfering normally with their functioning or bringing a, poli a wounded policeman to an area who is under control of the non-state armed groups. And this, this raises enormous fears among the health staff, and then the wounded person is not treated. We are trying to, to change that into a, a pre-arranged contingency planning that is a, supported by, by normative, an agreement between Ministry of Health, Ministry of Defense, that, that improves and, and uh, avoids these situations. Um, and I think I have because I, I have I have to apologize to you, but I handed over my presentation too late, and all the rest of the slides that should have been now explaining what I have told you. The last part is is not included. So no, this is this is an ugly one. This was explaining a bit the this was a draft uh, because I also sent the wrong one. Uh, I think it's it's a um, I think I hope I'm in time because I wanted to share with you the the recommendation. Colombia is, is a is a highly strange situation as I told you. It's a functional state coexisting with patches. With patches of of uh, of completely failed state, and so the, the 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 very broad lesson learned from me from these specificities of Colombia, and and sharing with you in Yemen, Somalia, and many other parts of the world, is that 
it, it's, it's, it's a bit common sense, but it's worth to restate. If the programs and interventions need to be adapted and tailored to each environment and context. Even within Colombia, with different contexts, we can import the way we work in, in Chocó, which is a lot like Haiti, to the way we work in Catatumbo, which is a bit more uh, a bit more structured with a different degree of development. So first, first recommendation, imperative to adapt interventions. I think the the idea of the idea of sharing best practice should never be considered as a blueprint. It's inspirational. Secondly, um, looking looking at the case of Colombia and all the debates about states' responsibilities, wherever the states are not collapse or failed states, they are responsible to take initiative and and and, uh, and that should be supporting the protection of healthcare. There is IHL, they all have signed Geneva conventions. There is the UN resolution that you mentioned. And in many cases, there is also a range of national normative we have uh, investigated here. And uh, we are advocating very strongly in Colombia, you have a problem with the context where there is a conflict and the IHL applies. In the areas when there is no conflict, and then human rights uh, law applies. Well, human rights law strongly defends healthcare. There is no need to resort to IHL to claim the protection of healthcare, and that's that's a very important thing. That that also, and then where states start uh, being involved, they should be supported. Uh, they should be advocated for, supported, and then coordinated with strongly. Uh, Third lesson from Jose, Colombia. Uh, we have a beautiful application. If you can, can wrap up in 30 seconds, 30 yes. seconds, please. Thank you. Yes, there is there is just one more, two more recommendations. The 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 third one that was on my list, the 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 beauty and the thoroughness of the involvement of the state with the normative, the coordination. I didn't have time to explain to you between Colombia Red Cross, ICFC, and PAHO and the Ministry of Health, that we are the core group. This has taken two decades to be developed. The length of the time that it takes to build it should not discourage anyone to start. Why not starting now? Even if we see the results in 10 years, it is worth to state to start state engagement whenever, so you will see the results later. The last one, arms bearer, the last recommendation, arms bearers are clearly a, a major actors and responsible in violence against healthcare, not, not the only ones. It is, it is necessary to engage with them and conventional preaching IHL is not the only way. And as healthcare providers, we have the very interesting approach of considering a arms bearers, the SCLC acronym, the, the euphemism for, for state forces and non citizen groups. They are both a aggressors and perpetrators and beneficiaries of the healthcare system. And we can we can play with that to improve protection of healthcare. I, I finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry Thank for my you. Over time. That's all right. That was very, very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Zay. Our final speaker um, is from Yemen, uh, Dr. Osan uh, from WHO. Dr. Osan, could you explain what the WHO is doing in Yemen to reduce attacks and any recommendations that you may have from those interventions? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I will uh, present to you uh, an experience from Yemen, from Yemen on contingency planning. Uh, next slide, please. So as most of us know that uh, uh, Yemen is witnessing a civil war since 2015 infol involving three major actors who have control on different parts uh, of the country and uh, mass casualty incidents, uh, communicable disease outbreaks, displacement of population in addition to uh, disturbances of health services are the main health consequences of uh, this uh, conflict. In this slide that you can see uh, the level of uh, functionality of uh, health facilities in addition to population in need and number of uh, IDPs. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so uh, the WHO work against uh, attacks on healthcare are based on a request from the member states in the World Health Assembly, resolution number uh, 65, article uh, 20, and that was in uh, 2012. 
to collect and disseminate data on attacks against uh, health resources in complex humanitarian uh, emergencies. And the uh, WHO surveillance system for attacks on uh, healthcare is one of the mechanisms to collect data in uh, 19 countries. And I'd like to stress here that uh, the SSA is not used for uh, accountability uh, purposes. It's only a monitoring uh, mechanism. Next slide, please. In Yemen, uh, attacks on healthcare have a dramatic impact on the population uh, we serve. The majority of these, uh, as you can see in the slide, involve the use of uh, heavy weapons and the impact uh, on uh, healthcare uh, facilities. And uh, beyond the direct deaths and injuries that uh, it causes, uh, they also deprive the entire communities of uh, essential health services in the long run. Next slide, please. So here, uh, I'm going directly to the uh, practice itself, which is the uh, contingency planning. So the mitigation measure uh, implemented in Yemen uh, to reduce harm to affected population aims to protect access to healthcare services during hostilities. And the uh, uh, contingency plan that we activated during uh, an uh, escalation of the conflict in the western part, uh, western part of Yemen the plan consists of a transfer of service provision from uh, the frontline hospitals to the second line hospitals after an attack to maintain access to healthcare for uh, those uh, in need. Next slide, please. So what the WHO did, the WHO started by coordination with health partners, followed by uh, providing these hospitals with life-saving medicines and supplies and skilled human resources, uh, in addition to support a uh, referral uh, system. And uh, uh, what I'd like to, to say here is, uh, this is not a prevention measure, but it's mainly a mitigation measure that uh, is activated when the frontline hospitals are exposed to uh, security uh, threats. Next slide, please. Uh, so the result of, of this uh, plan was that the, the three second line hospitals are uh, ready and continue to be on standby in case frontline hospitals become exposed to any type of attack or uh, security uh, threats. Also, the delivery of health services has been uh, maintained in Hajja and uh, Hudayda governorates despite uh, the armed conflict. And the last result, uh, after that, the health contingency uh, planning has become a widespread practice in uh, Yemen. Next slide. So uh, the main challenges in implementing uh, this practice, uh, it included finding qualified uh, health workers that uh, who are willing to work in the frontline health facilities, as well as the shortage of funding. Uh, in addition to that, uh, availability of uh, life-saving supplies, materials, uh, uh, it can be also uh, difficult to be found in the local market. Uh, what I want to go now is for the lesson learned. And uh, uh, from this experience, uh, that uh, we should always uh, uh, prepare our contingency plans based on a close uh, understanding of uh, local uh, conflict dynamics and also the importance of uh, coordination with uh, health partners ahead uh, from uh, or ahead uh, before we start uh, the planning uh, itself. Uh, the last slide, please. Just our next step that uh, we would like just to, 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 to improve and to call for further collaboration between the protection and health clusters at the national level. And that will uh, uh, definitely lead to improved efforts to mitigate the impacts of attacks and uh, uphold the, uh, the practice of healthcare uh, amidst uh, uh, the conflict. That's all from my side, colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Osan uh, from Yemen.
Uh, and a big thanks to all the panelists for sharing your practices and some of the innovative ways you're practically addressing this. Uh, it's really incredible to see such strong collaborations, uh, but still a demonstration that uh, we need uh, to do more and we need to do more together as health and protection actors. We now want to hear from you, the audience, on what else can we do or should we be doing? Um, we have a participant uh, Mentimeter where we ask for your ideas. Are there other examples of how protection-centered health interventions um, have prevented and reduced civilian harm? If so, what, when, who? And secondly, how can international com the international community further support health and protection actors in crisis to protect health assets? Uh, we'll take a few minutes um, and gather gather your feedback, uh, and then we will get back to the panelists uh, to respond to some of the questions. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for the speakers, uh, please uh, stick them in the chat. Uh, we are looking at it, and we will share this back um, with the panelists uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so five minutes to complete the questions, and we will be uh, coming right back up. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, as we try and collate uh, your responses, um, I would like to invite back uh, our panelists um, to kind of deliberate on some of the some of the uh, responses that we have from the Mentimeter. Um, I'm pleased to welcome back um, Dr. Mukesh, Shehu, James, Dr. Hosan, um, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Hosan. Um, I think first question that I, I, I have to you is, uh, is to the South Sudan team. In what ways um, might we enhance health interventions in contexts of crisis? How best can we prepare ourselves as protection service providers um, in situations of violence? If you could try and uh, keep it down to two minutes, quick response so that every uh, presenter is able to get an opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Mukesh, if you could start. Yeah, um, maybe, you know, uh, community is in center. Um, and, and then uh, in case of South Sudan, if um, uh, attacks are committing, committing, uh, coming from communities, it is very important that we make uh, aware of uh, challenges as well as what we are providing, our limitations uh, to the communities. Um, that will help uh, us to prepare communities uh, on 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 uh, accepting uh, our limitations, accepting our challenges. Uh, second one, health healthcare service provider, which is a uh, very much like majority are from field from from that community itself, and that uh, health service care provider, which is a part of us as well as part of community, will be a perfect link between community and health service provision. Um, that will help uh, to bring the community's confidence in healthcare, as well as uh, identifying early warning. No matter whatever attack is there, you get some early signals. And that early signals, recognizing that and responding and making sure your contingency plan is there is very important in mitigating impact of the healthcare. Let me stop here. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me just quickly add on to what Dr. McKess just mentioned. Um, I would really say um, awareness raising, it's, it's quite effective, which I think we need to keep raising awareness. And also um, peace building should be one of the component that should be um, mainstream into our programming because we understand how delicate um, South Sudan has been, how the long history of uh, war, and also um, a lot of uh, uh, cultural belief, which it is quite disintegrated from the, from the, uh, it is quite disintegrated from the, 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 the legal system which is something that we need to keep on raising awareness at the community level and keep engaging 
and also take every little rumor we think we hear, take it seriously and, and dissect it and to hear what to understand what are the, uh, the, the what are the reasons or what are the the, the the rumors all about and see how that can be best addressed. And, uh, and I think it will go a long way to prevent some of those uh, cases of attack. And as well, also ownership, ensure that the community takes ownership of the services being provided to them. Let them see the services that we are providing as their own services. We are just there to support them. We are not just there to provide. We are just there to support, to be just like an anchor for them to be sure that um, services reach out to them. Thank you. I, I think, uh, to me, just to add on what uh, Dr. Mokeja and Chehu have said, I think one thing that is also very important in South Sudan in the context that we are living in is to have uh, uh, an engagement with the youth because you see the youth are the majority and they are the ones that have been used by politicians to do a lot of destruction. So I think if we can have a mechanism of working with the with the nexus like the the, the 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 peace partners that will be able to sensitize the the youth that will really be very good and again to have also a special focus on women because you see women are the majority of the civilian and especially in South Sudan where a lot of men died during the war so if there is any escalation of a conflict they would be able to advise those few husbands that they have that don't don't go to destroy or don't go to kill. I think those will be, uh, help. And last thing is also to involve them in the planning. And, and I think as the humanitarian workers, we need to involve the community at the planning stage so that they take the ownership. And when conflict erupted, they are able to prevent the uh, facility. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um... Uh, for the Syria team, uh, Samira um, and uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Hussan from Yemen, uh, in your context, what is needed for health and protection actors to work together more effectively? Samira, if you can take um, it first. Yes. So, yeah, as you know, so Syria is a very complex um, uh, situation. We have different contexts in different areas of, of the country. Uh, but overall, um, I think to invest more on um, integrated uh, approach with health, uh, protection and health, and that specifically, for example, to invest more in uh, mobile uh, clinic, uh, mobile health protection uh, services, uh, because as mentioned, given the limited functionality of the of the health system, uh, so that's one way to invest more on that. Um, also. Um, to uh, again, we have also primarily uh, health centers where these are the safe spaces um, where you know different services are being provided, including health services. But we could also strengthen that, uh, invest more on those um, centers, um, the primary health services, provide GBV, uh, mental health, psychosocial support, and awareness raising, capacity building, and also um, legal uh, interventions, because this is also very important and takes me to the next um, um, point that is to work with the uh, protection, the health and protection can work better together, for example, to secure access, uh, facilitate access for uh, some of the IDPs. Uh, first of all, in negotiating the access, we, we have IDPs in um, camps, for example, that are not allowed to leave or, you know, suffering or need, in need of health um, assistance, but because um, they don't have, for example, civil documentation, legal identity, they're unable to reach those facilities. Here, uh, protection actors can work together with health to facilitate access to civil documentation, legal identity, but also to negotiate uh, and facilitate that uh, transport and access. Um, and also, you know, it was mentioned in terms of negotiations and uh, humanitarian negotiations. I think this is also important, again, to invest on it to strengthen um, already existing uh, interventions. Um, and also um, a protection of civilian programs means that some um, organizations are 
doing to, again, try to support those type of uh, interventions more um, in this context. Thank you very much, Samira. Uh, Dr. Alstan, anything to add? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I may take this point from the, uh, what we call it, the strategic uh, level. So uh, I think if both uh, protection and health can start by doing a joint risk analysis uh, for humanitarian needs overview, uh, especially for uh, uh, those countries in uh, emergencies, in addition also to do uh, the integrated planning and uh, programming in multi-sectoral uh, strategies, including the uh, to develop joint strategic uh, indicators uh, again, uh, sharing information uh, during the protection of uh, health situational analysis and protection uh, analysis update. These are some of the areas uh, that we can enhance the uh, coordination collaboration between the two sectors. Another thing is also uh, it will be good if both sectors uh, develop an integrating uh, or integrated uh, proposals for uh, fund opportunities. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, this uh, last thing happened recently here in Yemen when both uh, health and uh, protection sectors developed uh, one proposal in the area of uh, uh, landmine uh, risk uh, reduction. I think those are just uh, some ideas that if we uh, started to, to, uh, to implement at the strategic level between two sectors or any actors uh, between health and and protection it will it will help a lot on this thank you thank you so much uh dr jose we have a question uh here from the chat for you what are some of the biggest challenges in engaging with non state actors armed groups um and what arguments are useful in encouraging compliance with international humanitarian law You're on mute, Dr. Jose. Sorry for this. Uh, engaging with non-state armed groups is like engaging with any other interlocutor, but a bit more difficult in the very peculiar. We all know that engaging with prime ministers, with ministers of health, with uh, regional governors, well, you have to do your best to convince them. Some of them are really tough. Some of them are more reasonable. The same with, with, with uh, non-state armed groups. In Colombia, we have an enormous range of non citizen groups from highly leftist militant with the world structure doctrine, which is very easy to argument on their doctrine and their alleged respect to IHL, to complete criminal groups where, where, where legal arguments do not work. We always combine legal arguments and human or humanitarian impact arguments. We, we don't think that the law is a is a dry issue I've seen in the discussions before or around whether we should be advocating against attacks of healthcare because it is a violation of IHL. It's it's a it's an abhorrent, inhuman way to increase exponentially human suffering, and because of this is illegal, but not the other way around. The main thing, and if we can transmit to armed groups uh, on the on the neutral stance of the ICRC, it is important to remark to them that that. Very often, any attack against healthcare has no military advantage for them at all, and rather is a big discredit with the communities. Uh, but it's, it's, it's extremely on a case by case, and I don't claim that we have the magic wand to make it work always. We have also a wide range of response to our dialogue, and we have we have groups that are a bit more difficult. Uh, with with experienced staff on the on the field, in this case in Colombia, mostly the Colombian staff that are the ones that that stay here long enough. And, and with a diplomatic persistent attitude, we get to first start a dialogue and then to start introducing uh, arguments. Uh, well, in Colombia, we have, a, we have a, a privileged situation also in the dialogue with both state uh, security forces and the, and the non-state and groups, which, which we do not enjoy everywhere in the world, I have to, I have to admit. But it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an art of dialogue. And, I have to insist we use both legal and human arguments. That's why me as the health coordinator in the health uh, unit in Colombia has got 
to be nearly a satellite or an adjoint to the protection unit to support them with convincing human arguments and public health arguments to support the importance of, of protection of healthcare. About the previous question about coordination of a health cluster and protection cluster, I would have to share the 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 ICC experience and my personal experience. I work with with MSF for nearly twenty years, and I, I change purely medical action, very substitution. I think it's changing a lot now to ICRC, which is completely protection driven, and there is a big a click to be to be made. Um, I don't know when you are in the field. Do you feel like uh, like a WHO oriented institution who has to increase the vaccination coverage of children, or do you feel like a human, like a um, oh, I don't know, like like a human rights activist which is able to detect with your medical skills a uh, human rights violations to support with them? It's it's different approaches. When I work in the SCRC, I am here to put my medical skills at the service of protection, and it takes it takes a bit. It's it's a question of priorities. There are other areas where the pure medical public health priorities um, may be overwhelming, and then it is difficult to use your, your health knowledge and skills to support protection uh, arguments. But, but there are two different paths. They are complementary, but two different paths and approaches. It's, it's, the, it's the, the health activist and the public health technician, the technical approach. And, and they, 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 <laughs> they are similar, but not the same. And I think we need, we need for supporting a protection within a lot of health activists who are ready to be humble enough to put down their health and medical holy skills and knowledge and put it at the service of protection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just as a follow on to that question, uh, we have another question here uh, on your negotiations uh, for, yeah, for populations to access. Same. And I think we need, <laughs> we need for support in a protection with a lot of health activists who are ready to be humble enough to put down their health and medical holy skills and knowledge and put it at the service. Sorry, what, what is the question? I cannot read it on the. Uh, so that's the difference. Do you want me to reply to the questions on the on the text directly or? Um, it was the question on on negotiations. And uh -huh. uh, colleague was asking if your negotiations are for for populations to access healthcare, or if they are negotiations for armed actors to respect healthcare and its protections under IHL. That is that is a really good question because we had we we have had this discussion inside the SLC. When you look when you look at the spectrum of of violence against healthcare. You have some of them who are IHL violations and many of them who are public health disruptions with an impact on no access to healthcare. The legal, I was going to say dogmatic, but the legal strict part of the SRC has been wanting to focus on the violations of IHL and discussing with the armed groups so they don't violate IHL. The, protection of civilian population part of ICRC is much more concerned about the access to healthcare of populations affected by conflict, regardless of which which institution, which instance is, is, is perpetrating this violent disruption of healthcare. The predominant view and the, 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 the doctrine today in the ICRC is any disruption of healthcare, any violent disruption of healthcare that makes population in conflict areas not being able to access healthcare, we work on it. We take it serious. We work on disruptions of healthcare perpetrated by criminal groups. We work on disruptions of healthcare perpetrated by the violent communities, and we work on violations of healthcare perpetrated by by armed groups and hence IHL violations. We work on the whole spectrum, and the reason is that the focus of ICRC is to ensure, or one of the areas of concern of ICRC is the access to healthcare of populations in conflict-affected areas. We have a bad reputation because we are a bit strict about conflict-affected areas and we do not take care of whole countries, whole regions, or whole problematics. We focus on conflict-affected areas and these populations, we do our best to ensure they have access to healthcare. IHL is an enormous, strong tool to work on it, but it's not the only one. 
as I said, the range of actions we do is a lot of the resilience of healthcare staff, the behavior of the community, the broader messages, human messages, and not only IHL messages. Thank you so much uh, for that um, for that response. Uh, I think we are coming up to time, uh, and I would just want to thank you very much for your participation, uh, for joining us for this very very important session, and um, to thank all the panelists as well uh, for such a rich uh, and insightful discussions. I think the session today um, and the recent attacks um, on healthcare in Gaza and Ukraine, they really do bring home what happens when healthcare is under attack. Health personnel are risking their lives de daily to provide these services at a very high cost to their mental health. Uh, patients are often injured and killed, in, killed during such attacks and cannot access life-saving healthcare. When, when services are uh, suspended, communities cannot access them and they are deprived of healthcare they can no longer trust they can safely go to the hospital, that they can safely give birth, or they can safely bring their children for vaccinations. This is a matter of global importance. Most of those attacks against healthcare actually happen outside the headlines. We don't hear a lot about them. Last year, at least 35 health workers were kidnapped in Cameroon. In DRC, more than 20 hospitals were burned down in just 12 months. In Myanmar, many direct attacks, as in Ukraine, were conducted, were recorded between February 2021. But whose responsibility is this? It is the responsibility of governments to provide safe and prompt access to healthcare and to ensure the protection of that healthcare. Non-state actors are also responsible to provide safe access to healthcare for the communities under their control. All parties to the conflict must ensure protection of safe access to healthcare. Almost all countries in the world have endorsed the right to health. That means the governments are responsible for bringing healthcare in safe reach for all sections of the population, including persons with disabilities and for vulnerable groups. More than seven years ago, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 2286, which calls for greater protection for healthcare in armed conflict. It is time for states to reaffirm these commitments with practical action. It is time for them to reaffirm these commitments. Even in armed conflict, all parties are to uphold international humanitarian law and international human rights laws, which dictate Health personnel, patients, medical vehicles, and health facilities are protected. So what is our role as humanitarian actors? It is clear that not all governments and armed actors are able or willing to comply with international humanitarian law and international human rights law. In several situations, the communities have played a significant role to ensure the protection of healthcare, as do civil society networks and local actors. Where there are gaps, humanitarian and development actors have stepped up in support of local and national capacities. The World Health Organization, through its WHO Attacks on Healthcare Initiative, has set up a system to monitor and respond to attacks, as Dr. Osan in Yemen has shown us. The health cluster coordinates local level response and advocacy with frontline and human rights actors, as illustrated by the health cluster team in South Sudan. The Safeguarding Health Care in Conflict Coalition brings together civil society actors to share data, provide analysis, and advocate for change. Health humanitarian organizations such as IRC negotiate on a daily basis with communities and non-state actors to grant safe access to communities and health care, but it is not always sufficient. This collaboration can be addressed, cannot be addressed by just one actor alone. It requires a strong collaboration between health and protection teams. The joint operational framework established by health and protection cluster is an example of an initiative that can be used for such collaboration. 
Today, we've had some good examples from South Sudan, Yemen, and Colombia. However, the different speakers also clearly highlighted the challenges and what needs to be urgently done to address these issues. That is joint analysis by health and protection actors to understand the issues, exchanges between health and protection actors to increase awareness of common objectives, collaboration between health and protection for joint action and response to help reduce violence and the impact of violence and increased resources to end violence and implement interventions to reduce such violence. Attacks on healthcare is a protection concern that requires action at all levels, from local to global and across all sector. I really hope this session has brought us one step closer to working together to protect civilians. Thank you all for taking the time and looking forward for continued conversations on this issue of attacks on healthcare. Thank you for joining us today.